I think it was David Hume who put it slightly vulgarly. This was again about the virgin birth, I think. Which is more likely, that the whole natural order is suspended, or that a Jewish minx should tell a lie? <laughs> if there is no supervis supervisory being, then what do we base morality on? Is it based on who has the might at any given time? Who's in power? What is morality based on? If there is no order to the universe, and therefore some being, some, some force that ordered it, then who determines what is right and wrong, what is moral and immoral? You use very religious terms interchangeably while you attack the idea of a god. There is nothing immoral if there's nothing in charge. Uh, when you see something otherwise surprising to you, such as a good person acting in a wicked manner, it's very often because they believe they're under divine orders to do so. Uh, Stephen Weinberg puts it very well. He says, left to themselves, evil people will do evil things and good people will try and do good things. If you want a good person to do a wicked thing, that takes religion. <laughs> I do not think that any person looking at a newborn baby would think, how wonderful, what a gift, but now just let's start sawing away at its genitalia with a sharp stone. Who would give them that idea if not the godly? And what kind of argument from design is this? Babies are not born beautiful, they're born ugly, they need to be sawn a bit. <laughs> because the handiwork of God is such garbage. Well, honestly. It's rubbish. Only religious people reading scriptures of some sort have done wicked things in the history of the world. Actually, secular criminality on the political level wasn't really possible until pretty much the late 18th century because the, the religious monopoly on violence and cruelty and torture and slavery and so on was so intense. <laughs> the long cultural process is to try and move people up to a cultural and intellectual level where they are above that kind of appeal, where they're not credulous, where they don't take things on faith, where they don't make gods or idols or images out of anybody, including fellow human beings and they learn the pleasures of thinking for themselves. How about that for a modest proposal? You, if you see something apparently um, involving suspension of the laws of nature, shall we say the sun standing still so Joshua can win his battle, all right? Or the raising of Jairus's daughter or uh, even my favorite miracle, the turning of the um, water into wine at Cana. Um, a, tribute, a tribute to the Hellenistic influence that still persisted in Palestine at that time. Um, you still have to ask yourself the question, which is more probable, that the laws of physics or nature have been suspended, by the way, in my favor, uh, or that I'm under a misapprehension? Everyone has to ask themselves that question. That's if they saw it themselves. If they take it as a report uh, issued through and filtered through dozens of other non-eyewitnesses and corrupt texts down the years, then I would think anyone who says they think of the resurrection as a historic fact is advertising a willingness to believe in absolutely anything. Let's have another question. I knew we would have most of the rabbis' time taken up with good works done by religious people. An absolutely irrelevant point. I mean, if I'm arguing with a Mormon and saying to them, the idea that Joseph Smith, not far from here, found gold plates dictated by God and was led to them by a salamander and therefore was about plural marriage, incest and land theft. Are you kidding me? This is a sick cult, a crazy, obvious fraud that you can look up in the archives of the local newspapers of New York State. You can see the trip being pulled. The Mormon will say, I know what's coming by the way. You should see our missionaries in action in Colombia. We send out young people to do good works in the Andes, in the Himalayas, in the Sudan. No doubt they do. And is their motive just to help? Or is it maybe to make more Mormons and to spread the book? Have you tried it, by the way? Has anyone ever tried the book of Mormon? You know what Mark Twain said about it? Chloroform in print. <laughs> is it not the case? I invite the rabbi to comment. Why does Hamas justify its theological and theocratic tyranny in Gaza? Because it's the only provider of welfare and social services. Which it is. Which it is. Uh, all over Africa, there are millions of Catholics working every day to make more Catholics. And they say, as their Pope tells them to say, yes, AIDS is very bad, but it's not as bad as condoms are.
as a result of which they're responsible for the deaths of millions of Africans. Because their work is that of proselytization. Don't call it charity. It's, they're doing it for Jesus. It's not for its own sake, and for it to be moral, to be really human, charitable, to have the, the, the things about it that appeal to us, which I'll come to in a moment, it shouldn't be proselytizing, <laughs> should it? We all know, well, those of us who have studied poverty and visited the third world, there is only one cure for poverty. And religion is always on such good terms with poverty, don't you notice? Poverty, illness, disease, ignorance, religion always thrives there. They have a sort of partnership with it. It's always their fallback position, for a good reason. The two things feed on each other. There's only one thing that cures poverty, whether it's Bangladesh or Bolivia. It's the empowerment of women. It's the only known cure. If you give women control over their reproductive cycle, take them off the animal cycle that forces them to bear children and that doesn't allow them any say in the size of their family, because they have to breed children to replace the ones who are going to die of the filth and the poverty and the disease that the priests have brought in their train, if you take them off that cycle, go back to that village in five years, the floor of material well-being and education will already have improved. Throw in a handful of seeds and a bit of credit, the job is done. Name me one religion that argues for the empowerment of women. Now, when you say, Brad, really, you, one should be shot when a priest commits an act of filthy uh, criminality. I say I'm not shocked at all. Why am I not shocked? Well, if you design, I'll just take a leading example, a salient one, a Roman Catholic church, which preaches that women are vessels of temptation, which insists on celibacy, that makes sex a matter of guilt and shame, uh, that is composed of an all-male priesthood, uh, the, the whole practice of which is based on a sexual repression. What do you think is going to happen to the children in the care of those people? Don't act surprised. They don't act surprised. They knew what was going on all the time. And they covered up for it. Where is cardinal law, may I ask you? Former prince of the church in these United States. Why is he in Boston where do you want to know this? Why is he not in the top? Because he's in the Vatican. Because he's fled the jurisdiction and been given a sinecure at the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome and voted in the conclave to, to produce the next pope. The, the, the holder of the keys of Peter, the vicar of Christ on earth. This man who ran a racket of child abuse, why do we call it abuse? Of the rape and torture of children for generations, decades, and across a wide swath of the country. And it's not because, it's not in spite of his religion, it's because of it. You, what, here's, do, yourself okay. your, do yourself and your faith the honor of saying it's faith. Don't no, 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 say no, no. science-based. The argument you would be... You won't get away with it. Look, the argument would be, Christopher, is that if the universe exploded into being out of nothing, then miracles are possible because the greatest miracle of all has already occurred. The question is, yeah. have miracles occurred in the first century? No, miracle, that requires another debate whereby we have to look at the historical evidence and see. And if it is true that... The, uh, that Jesus really did come and say and do the things that the New Testament writer said he did, then whatever he teaches is true, because if he rose from the dead, he was God. If he taught that there will be an intervention, then there will be. That's the argument. I don't have time to support it. Very good. Now, a sentence or two from David Hume would, would correct what you said. A, a miracle is defined not as a part of the natural order, but as a suspension of the order. That it's a suspension of what it starts. You may not do that. However, if you meet someone in the street who you yesterday saw executed, you can say either that an extraordinary miracle has occurred or that you are under a very grave misapprehension. And David Hume's logic on this, I think, is quite irrefutable. He says, what is more likely, that the laws of nature have been suspended in your favor and in a way that you approve, or that you've made a mistake? And in each case you must, start, and especially if you didn't see it yourself and you're hearing it from someone who says that they did. I would go further and say the following. I'll grant you that it would be possible to track the pregnancy of the woman Mary, who's mentioned about three times in the Bible, uh, and to show that there was no male intervention in her life at all. But yet she delivered herself of a healthy baby boy. I can say, I, I don't say that's impossible. Parthenogenesis is not completely unthinkable, but it does not prove that his paternity is divine. 
And it wouldn't prove that any of his moral teachings were thereby correct. Nor, if I was to see him executed one day and see him walking the streets the next, would that show that his father was God, or his mother was a virgin, or that his teachings were true? Especially given the commonplace nature of resurrection at that time and place. After all, Lazarus was raised, never said a word about it. The daughter of Jairus was raised, didn't say a thing about what she'd been through. Um, and the Gospels tell us that at the time of the crucifixion, all the graves in Jerusalem opened and their occupants wandered around the streets to greet. A few, so it seems the resurrection was a, a, a something of a banality at the time. Not all, not all of those people clearly were divinely uh, conceived. So I'll, I'll give you all the miracles and you'll still be left exactly where you are now, holding an empty sack. Coming up on the inside track, as it might be said, in Afghanistan and barely noticed by us, uh, was a fusion of the idea of the one-man rule and the one-party rule with the one-God rule that makes this, this uh, dictatorship even more iron and inflexible and menacing because, like the others, it leads to failure, state failure, and like the other state failures, it will not blame itself for its failure, but will export this violence and blame conspiracies of others for its own collapse. And for me, the special symbol of that also took place in 19... 89, when the theocratic head of a foreign state who'd just lost a war with Saddam Hussein, the Ayatollah Khomeini, offered money in his own name for the purpose of the suborning of murder of a writer of fiction living in London who was not an Iranian citizen, a friend of mine by, by chance named Salman Rushdie. A very radical challenge, I thought, to every possible value that's represented by the Western uh, Enlightenment into a free expression. Every now and then, if you're like me and you go on the air and you debate with some whining, self-righteous, self-hating, self-pitying Muslim, and you tell him what you think of his Quran and his prophet, and so he says, you have offended a billion Muslims. You notice this? You notice that? There's a slight tone of moral blackmail here, I sometimes think. Look, if it was a matter of defending the right of somebody to hold their religious opinion, I would defend the right of a Muslim if there were only three of them. The idea of a billion is clearly intended as a threat. It's, uh, there's a menace to that. You've upset a billion of us. You should watch out. That's what it means. And we're going to try and move in to your city and your country, too. And we're going to raise more and more demands. That's what's meant by it. But what about a billion Hindus? What about a billion Hindus who've been declared anathema, who have been declared fit for slaughter at any time, at any place? They're not even monotheist. Look what happened, for example, to the Nepalese guest workers in Iraq. Did anybody see that unbearable video of the mass slaughter and throat cutting of these Hindus. You have to see it to believe it, and the commentary that goes with it, too. And in my opinion, half of Palestine won't quite satisfy them. And in my, in my other opinion, which I'll share with you, uh, nobody blows themselves up in a Jewish old people's home on Passover in Netanya, on the Mediterranean coast of Israel proper, not in a settlement, not against the wall, not in an occupied territory. Nobody does that in order to bring about a compromise. It's just an instinct I have. <laughs> I have the feeling that they won't be happy until there are no more Jews in what used to be mandate Palestine. That's certainly what they say they want. I'm in favor of taking the enemy seriously to that extent. All that it takes is the refusal of the elected Prime Minister of Denmark to agree, waited upon as he was by a delegation of 20 Arab ambassadors, to break his own country's law and tell an afternoon newspaper in Copenhagen that it couldn't publish certain cartoons. That's all it takes to bring about jihadism now. That's the threshold of provocation. Now you have to be, I think, a real masochist to say, well then we must avoid doing this kind of thing. Because all they're asking is that we change everything that makes our way of life different from theirs. And then it's true, I suppose, there would be very little to fight about. But in the meanwhile, I think that we have to face the fact that it's a clash of civilization, of course, and about civilization, and within a civilization. It does represent also, a, I, I think it's nice to be able to note, a war within Islam too, where we don't know how lucky we are that fighting on our side are forces of the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan and of the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan in Iraq, whose emblem I'm proud to wear in my lapel, People who are fighting against Saddam for us and taking heavy, heavy casualties when we thought his regime was a matter of indifference. And these people are just as Muslim and have just as good a right to claim that they observe that faith as do anyone else. We should never forget our duty of solidarity to them 
and uh, they are our brothers and sisters in arms. And with the other victims of bin Ladenism and this horrifying cult of death and murder and suicide that says that it loves itself and its cult more than we love life. Much depends then, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades, friends, much depends on the multiple ways in which we can disprove that assertion and, and assert the power of life and pluralism over, over the morbid, sordid, and medieval enemy uh, that we're now faced with. Thank you. If you, <laughs> claim it, if you claim it for one, you have to claim it for all. It seems to me. It means that that means you accept that, yes, Hamas does a lot of good with social services. Yes, Louis Farrakhan gets black kids off drugs. Yes, the Mormons must have had a, a point devout as they were when they said black people didn't have souls, as they did until the 1970s. That, that everything attributable to religion uh, must, be, must be attributable to it. You can't just pick and choose the bits that you like. The abolition of cannibalism is one thing. The Muslims say they, they abolished uh, child sacrifice, but think of the things they also brought. And, and tell me if this doesn't show what I've been arguing from the first, that it is a man-made institution, not a divinely appointed one, and that you get exactly the sort of coincidences you would expect from that. The world looks as it would look if there was no God. One of the reasons why I have the lurid subtitle I do, my book, The Religion is a Poison, is that it makes ordinary moral people uh, compels them, forces them, in some cases orders them, to do disgusting, wicked, unforgivable things. There's no expiation for the generations of misery and suffering that religion has inflicted in this way and continues to inflict, and I still haven't heard enough apology for it. Christopher, I've, I've got to call you down on refer referring to circumcision as genital mutilation. My son cried more at his first haircut than he did at his bris. <laughs> And statistically, you weren't doing it right then. <laughs> statistically, the, the only long-term effect that it seems to have on people is it increases their chances of winning a Nobel Prize. I can't, um, I can't find the, the um, compulsory uh, mutilation of the genitals of children as subject for humor in that way, or flippancy in that way. Maimonides says very plainly, that it's designed to repress uh, sexual pleasure, to deprive us, uh, a, ma a male child as far as possible of the opportunity of that as a result of this disgusting practice. That you, that a person as humane as yourself can sit here and, be, and think of that as a fit subject for humor shows what I mean. Religion makes morally normal people say and do disgusting and wicked things. And you've just proved my point for me. Shame on you for saying what you just said. Shame on you for saying it about your own son, my God. Let's move on. Yes, let's. What next? Cutting the labia of little girls. At least Judaism doesn't do